Are you getting used to being masked up and all this stuff? I'm telling you, glad you're here today. And if you're visiting with us, welcome. If you're here today, if you're online, uh, you're probably going, uh, what's the little kid's video? Well, most of nearly all of our young families do not want to come to church because of the COVID-19. And we really don't have anything for them because of the COVID-19. And so they can watch this at home. And they can print out their own little fill-in. All the kids can. There's a younger kids one. There's an older kids one. So they can print it out and fill it in themselves. And if they can't watch it now, we have it also on our Facebook page, our Kids Blast 180 Kids uh, page, and they can watch it later as well. So I'm glad you are here. Did you have a happy 4th of July? I, I guess so. <laughs> You're up late, huh? Did you stay up and watch the lunar eclipse? Yeah, we had a lunar eclipse last night from about midnight to about 3 a.m. And uh, I'm on prednisone for poison ivy, so I have not slept at all last night. So at 4 a.m., I watched a biography on TV on Billy Graham, so all right? So that's how I spent my 4th of July. And today, it, I wanted to do something different for today. And if you're visiting with us and you've been coming here, we are going through a series called Through the Storm, looking at the life of Daniel. But since this is the 4th of July, I thought I would do a sermon kind of around that issue. And, uh, you know, every time it comes to this type of holiday, 4th of July, there are pastors who do sermons on what's right with America. And then there are pastors who do sermons on what's wrong with America. And there's nothing right or wrong with either one. But I thought for today, based on where we are as a nation, what can we do to influence our nation? How can we make a difference in our nation today with everything that's going on? And the principles I'm going to share with you today, you can use at work, at school, at home. You can use in your communities, in your neighborhoods. You can use them in your business, wherever you go. Because freedom is a price that many have paid for us to be here and to sit in this kind of an environment without threat or fear for our lives. So the question is, how do we go use this freedom to the betterment of God and for our country. And so today, <laughs> I'm going to be a child. I'm going to go back to one of my favorite Old Testament stories. I loved it as a kid. And it's called Noah and the Ark. You ever heard of it? All right, it's one of my favorite stories because there are four biblical principles we can gain out of this wonderful story about Noah, uh, how we can make a difference in our community, in our culture, in our works, at our schools, wherever you may be. So let's look at it. There are four principles, and here's the first one. If I want to make a difference in our culture, I must first dare to be different. And we see this in Noah's life. When all the crowd was going one way, Noah goes a different way. He takes the road less travel. He doesn't find an easy way out. He didn't go along with the show. He didn't go along with the crowds. In fact, he just took the exact opposite direction. Look at this in Genesis chapter 6. It says this. When God saw the extent of human wickedness and that the trend and direction of man's lives were only towards evil, he was sorry he had made them. And it broke his heart. Now notice this, but Noah was a pleasure to the Lord. So Noah dared to be different. Noah decided in advance, whatever the outcome, whatever the fallout, whatever the consequences, I'm going to be different for God. Notice it says that in Noah's day, all the human race is going this direction, and Noah's heading this direction. The world was so filled with violence and crime, and corruption, greed, sin, that God says, this just makes me sick to my stomach. I want to start all over. And it says, in the midst of this darkness of the world at that time, there are two little words. There are in the beginning of verse 8, two words. What are they? But Noah. You often miss it in the English because you're just reading Scripture. But this is important. Everyone else in Noah's day is heading this direction, except who? Noah. He's going in the opposite direction. In order to make a difference, you have to choose to be different. So Noah dared. So if you want to make a difference at work, a difference in school, difference in your community, a difference in your home, you have to choose to be different. 
You can only make a difference if you're different. That's the only way you can make a difference. And so if you want to make a difference in our nation, you got to be different. And this is true of every person who's ever made a significant contribution in the history of the world or even our country. I mean, think about it. Up until Columbus, everybody in the world thought the world was what? Flat. Columbus says, I'm going to be different. I'm going to prove the world's not flat. And I imagine when they saw that last part of that top of that sail disappear on the horizon, they went, bye-bye, Columbus. And he proved the world wasn't flat. I thought about Jonas Salk. How many of you got a polio vaccine scar here? All right, you younger ones have no idea what I'm talking about, do you? Uh, we'll mask up and show you later, okay? All right? But polio was a horrible disease that caused a lot of deaths among children. And a lot of doctors tried, a lot of scientists tried, and they gave up. They said, we'll never find it. But Jonas Salk said, no, I'm different. I will find a cure. I will find a vaccine for polio. And he did. You know, I've been a pilot for years. I love flying planes. And the Wright brothers were the first ones to come along to say, hey, we believe that machines heavier than air can fly. And they proved it. And you think of all the people who've made a difference in the world, they had to make a choice to go against the odds and show the world that it could be done. And thus, the whole world benefited from it, and the whole world was impacted from it. So let me get personal about this. i got a couple questions for you. What do you see around you, in your family, in your life, in your community, at work, that needs to be changed? The price of change is this. Somebody has to dare to be different. That's the price of change. Until somebody's willing to pay that price, nothing will happen. I mean, can you imagine Noah in that day? The ridicule he went through, the mockery he went through. I mean, he's basically building the Queen Mary in his backyard. I mean, just imagine his neighbors coming up to him going, Noah, what in the world are you doing? And other people, he's nuts. He's crazy. He's a loon. His elevator not only doesn't go to the top, it doesn't even move. I mean, think about this. He says God told him to do this. He's crazy. He's a loon. Hey, by the way, has anybody called the HOA about this and see if he got permission? I mean, think about this. He's building the Queen Mary in his backyard. And think about this. His kids. Dad, can't you get a normal job? Can't you just do something so we're not made fun of at school? Do you know how many people joke? Oh, look at your dad. He's off his rocker. But you'll be on that boat rocking one day, won't you? All the ridicule, the mockery. And he chose to still be different. To go against the grain, to go against the crowd. He chose to be different. And when you decide to take a stand and be different, there will be those who will ridicule you. They will mock you. They will make fun of you. And when I looked at this story, what amazed me is the verse says, while the trend in the whole world was to go this way, two words, but Noah, he went this way. He chose to obey God in spite of all of this. You can only make a difference by choosing to be different. Most of you know this verse, Romans 12, 2. It says this, do not be conformed to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is. His good, pleasing, and perfect will. The Living Bible puts it this way. It says this, don't copy the behavior and customs of this world, but be a new and different person with a fresh newness in all you do and think. Then you'll learn how God's ways really satisfy. I mean, would you agree today there is a tremendous pressure to conform in our society? There is. We're supposed to act alike, talk alike, think alike, dress alike, eat alike. I remember when I was a youth pastor out in California. They'd always want me to pray in church. Because back then I had a deep southern accent. It's just like when we run across somebody from England. Oh, would you say that again? Would you talk again? Okay. When you were in another part of the country, you can tell in my neighborhood, we got people moved from all different parts of our country. We can kind of isolate them based on their accent. 
You can tell a Texan draw from anywhere. You can tell a New England draw from anywhere. You can tell a Mississippi draw from anywhere. Though we are different, we are pressured to be the same. And there's this tremendous pressure. But God says, don't copy the culture. Conformity is often the enemy of Christianity. Conformity says, I'm going to be like everybody else because that's what I'm supposed to be. There's this American myth that says that if the majority is doing it, it must be okay. I can give you illustrations after illustration where the majority has been wrong. So if you want to make something out of your life, if you want to make an impact on the others around your life, if you want your life to count, you have to choose to be different. And sometimes that means going in the exact opposite direction, like Noah did, to where you stand out. You may be that lone voice in your neighborhood, that lone voice at work, that lone voice at school, that lone voice in your community, that lone voice even in your own family. Here's the second principle I want you to see. To make a difference in my culture, I must look at life through God's point of view. If you want to make a difference in your culture, you've got to look at life from God's point of view. Noah does this. He is looking at life from what I would call an eternal perspective, God's point of view. Look at Genesis 6-9. Noah was the only truly righteous man living on the earth at that time. Look at that. Think about it. We don't know how populated the earth was, but of all the people living on the earth at the time, Noah is uno. Uno, the only righteous man on the earth at that time. He tried to always conduct his affairs according to God's will. And that's exactly what Noah does in the Genesis story. He didn't worry about what other people thought. He only worried about what what does God think about what I'm supposed to do. He simply asked God, what do you want me to do? And I'll do it. He didn't sit around and go, well, you know, God, what if this happens? What if this happens? And if you're the type of person that God brings you a challenge and you go, well, uh, can you guarantee success? God can't use you. So what does it mean to look at life from God's point of view? It means this. It means that if you want to be satisfied, you want to have fulfillment in life, you want to have meaning in life, you got to be willing to do what God says no matter what the culture says. Now think about this. When I say living life from God's point of view, I also mean this. I'm 62 years old. I was in McAllister's this past week. And one of the girls was waiting on me at the counter. We're all masked up. And and I got talking to her, and I said, you know, you're here to go to school? Yeah, and all this stuff. And she goes, uh, she says, well, I can tell you're the same age as my father. I'm going, sweetheart, I don't think so. I'm old enough to probably be your grandfather. She went, no, no way. She said, you're in your 40s, right? I said, dinner's on me. Dinner's on me, okay? I said, no, I'm 62 years old. Now, isn't it amazing when we're young, 60 seems forever away. It just seems a long ways away. You may get 60, 70, 80, 90 years, maybe 100 years, maybe 104 like Olivia de Havilland. She had her 104th birthday. You may get that long, but it's going to end. Life ends. Everything on this planet ends at some point. Nothing lasts forever. So looking at life from God's point of view means you realize something. You realize that there are long-term consequences for every action you take. Every action you take. There's a domino effect that has long-term consequences from every action you take. You realize that this world is not your permanent home. You're just passing through here. The book of Hebrews puts it this way. For this world is not our home. We're looking forward to our everlasting home in heaven. I want you to circle looking forward. We are looking forward. Our view is in front of us. And that is, this is not our home. We're just kind of passing through. Okay? And if you want to choose to see life from God's point of view, you have to remind yourself this isn't all there is. I'm here temporarily, and then I move on. I'm here on earth, and then I go to heaven. And so that means that 
your life's not filled with trying to get the most toys and the most material possessions because they're not going to last either. You get 60, 70, 80, 90 years, and that's it, and then it ends. And then it goes to somebody else. If you've ever had to deal with the death of grandparents or parents, you know what I'm talking about. As I've told you numerous times, I've never, ever seen a U-Haul in a funeral possession. You can bury it with you, but you can't take it with you. Whatever you have goes to somebody else. You came into this world with nothing, and you're going to leave this world with nothing. So why would you spend your whole life thinking that the ultimate goal in life is things? When you look at life from God's point of view, you realize that the greatest things in life are not things. They are relationships. They are people. That's the greatest thing in life. Paul writes this in 2 Corinthians 4, 8 about another great thing, biblical values. He says, we fix our attention not on things that are seen, but on things that are unseen. What can be seen lasts only for a time, and what cannot be seen lasts forever. So Paul here, he's given us that there's two basic realities in life. There's the visible world that you can see like this, and there's the invisible world you cannot see. And he says in the visible world, it's all going to go to rubble one day. It's all going to crumble one day. It's not going to be here. Everything material rusts out, rots out, breaks down, crashes, falls apart. It goes away. But there's this invisible world, Paul says, that's here forever. For example, you can't see God, but we believe he's here. We believe he's with us. We believe he's in us. We believe he's in this world. We believe he's in this world, though we cannot see him. So we need to put our value on what's going to last. He's saying you need to learn to see that what's most important in life are the relationships you have with each other and with other people and with the Lord Jesus Christ. And if you get this down, you get this point down that looking at life from God's point of view, you're, the headlines are not going to bother you anymore. What you see on the news is not going to bother you anymore. Your mood is not going to be impacted by what happens in the world somewhere because your mood is going to be dependent upon looking at life from God's point of view. Where am I going with God? What am I doing with God? Where does God want me to go now? In fact, looking at life from God's point of view will help you deal with your failures and your mistakes, your disappointments, your regrets. Let me ask you this, just show of hands. How many of you got some regrets? <laughs> Don't we all? <laughs> I'm so grateful Jesus Christ wipes the slate clean. You see, when you look at life from God's point of view, you can even deal with your regrets. Because these things from our past, our failures, our mistakes, our regrets, our disappointments can weigh on us. So the best way you get past your mistakes, your failures, your sins, your regrets, and your disappointments is to see life from God's point of view. He is going to give you a new life. This whole life's going to end. You're going to walk into a new life. You're going to live forever in heaven. So to make a difference with your life, it's important that you look at life from God's point of view. Here's the third point. Do you want to make a difference in our culture? To make a difference in our culture, I must depend on God when he asks me to do something. Especially, like, somehow symbolically build an ark. And this is especially true. Noah did everything from God's point of view. Look at this. Noah did everything exactly as God had commanded him. I want you to circle the word everything. It doesn't say some things or part of things. He did everything God told him to do. And he depended on God to do this. God came to him and said, I want you to build an ark. And if I'm Noah, I'm probably going, what's an ark? It's not like they had the ark museum back then in Kentucky that they have today. He didn't have a clue as to what God's talking about. So God has to explain to him what an ark is. So God laid out the why and the what. But don't you think if God came to you and said, I want you to build an ark, you'd have some questions? You might have some excuses. You might have some objections. You might want to figure how you can wiggle yourself out of this. I mean, I can think of a number of questions I would have if God came to me and said, Kelly, I want you to build an ark. 
As I thought about this, this is your next two points, that made me think of some things that were going on in Noah's time that he had to consider. See, up to this point, the Bible gives the impression that people had never even seen rain because it possibly had never rained. So when God says it's going to rain for 40 days and nights, he's going, God, what's rain? Look at this in Genesis chapter 5. When the Lord made the earth and the heavens, neither wild plants nor grains were growing on the earth. For the Lord God had not yet sent rain to water the earth, and there were no people to cultivate the soil. Instead, springs came up from the ground and watered the land. Now, there are some scholars say, well, this was during the creation facet before God put the animals and the people here. Maybe so. Some argue that there was probably rain later around Noah's time. We don't know, but the impression is there may have not ever been rain until Noah. And so when God says it's going to rain, Noah's going, what's rain? Well, you know that water comes up from the springs from the ground? Yeah, it's going to come down from the sky. Really? Here's the second thing. See, the closest ocean was at least 500 miles away from where he was building the ark. I mean, if you're going to build an ark, don't you want to be near water? Now, we know approximate where he built the ark based on where his family lived. Noah had a great-grandson named Nimrod. When you have your next son, name him Nimrod. Nimrod went and found Nineveh. You've heard of Nineveh. That's with Jonah. That's another children's story, all right? And in those days, they didn't travel far. Family groups stayed together because you got to have water supply. you got to have good land to grow your crops. So you got to have fertile land. And most of that land over there is desert. If you go there today, you see it's mostly desert. There are these little oases that people came around. So they didn't travel far. So we know where Nineveh is. So we can kind of approximate where Noah was somewhere around the border of Babylon. So the closest ocean is about 500 miles away. And if I'm Noah, I'm probably thinking, how am I going to get this boat to the closest ocean? I mean, here's another question I have. I'm Noah. God, how are you going to get all these animals here? How are we going to get all these animals two by two on the ark? And how are you going to keep the predators from killing the other animals? You know, when I get to heaven, I have, I have one question for Noah, and it's this. Did you have to bring the two flies on the ark? Because if you had not done it, you saved all of us a lot of headache. Okay? Bring two of every kind. For a long time, I thought, <laughs> maybe from the ark, Noah did a lot of fishing. But I realized he couldn't do that because he only had two worms, okay? So he didn't do that either, all right? Uh, by the way, do you know what kind of... Uh, Lights ahead on the ark, floodlights, all right? That's your children's joke for the day, all right? Noah says, God, whatever you want me to do, I'll do it. An impossible task, especially he had never seen rain, and especially since the closest ocean is 500 miles away. And if you want to make a difference in your life for Jesus Christ, you have to choose to be different. You have to choose to not go along with the crowd. You have to choose to look at life from God's point of view. You have to choose, I will depend on God however difficult this is, no matter how I'm mocked or made fun of. Because you know, as a born-again believer in Jesus Christ, you have the indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit that Noah didn't have. He didn't have that. You have something that Noah doesn't even have. You have the Holy Spirit of the living God in you. And he empowers you to do these things. Philippians 2, Paul writes this. For God is working in you, giving you the desire and the power to do what pleases him. The Living Bible puts it this way. For God is at work within you, helping you want to obey him, and then helping you to do what he wants. So what Paul tells us here is that whatever God asks you to do, he also gives you the power to do it. And if you want to make a difference in your culture, you want to make a difference in your school, you want to make a difference at your work, you want to make a difference in your community, you want to make a difference in your business, you want to make a difference in your home, you got to choose to be different. you got to look at life from God's point of view. you got to depend on God. And that's called faith. Moses, Noah, Abraham, David, all the patriarchs of the Bible stepped out in faith with God, and so does Noah. 
Faith is obeying God when it does not make sense. Faith is obeying God that from a human point of view, it looks stupid. It looks silly. It looks ridiculous. It looks impossible. You're willing to be made fun of and mocked of and joked about. Because you know God told you to do this. In our last church where Audrey and I were, before I went there, when they were talking to me about coming there, they wanted me to be their senior pastor. We discovered that the church had gone through some tumultuous times. They had, about a couple years earlier, built a new educational building. They, spent, they borrowed $1.2 million to do it. About a year later, they went through a split, and over half of the people left. And when they were talking to me, they said, we need to let you know that 48 cents of every tithe dollar that comes in goes to pay the debt. So that's basically 50 cents of every dollar that people gave was going to pay the debt. They didn't leave much for payroll. They didn't leave much for ministry. It didn't leave much for anything else. And that first year I was there was tough. It was really, really tough. And I remember during my private quiet times with God, I, I started getting these impressions from God. If you will trust me, I'll get this debt going so you can do a lot more. And so I'm, I'm the analytical type. I'm asking, how are you going to do this? God says, I'm going to use you. Okay? How are you going to use me? What do you want me to do? He says, well, I want you to go to the leadership of your church and tell them I'm going to pay this debt off. Okay? What's, can I have a little more than that? God, 48 cents of every dollar is going to pay the debt. No, that's all I'm going to tell you right now. I, I just want you to go. So I shared it with our leadership, and nearly every one of them bailed on me. They thought I was nuts. They thought I was crazy, except for a couple of people. Here they've brought this new pastor in, and he's, in their mind, maybe losing it mentally. He's not stable because he believes that God actually told him God was going to do this. And so I went back and I said, God, all right, I've, I've, I'm out front here of this. I've told them this. Now what's the next step? And God said, this is what I want you to do. I want you to go to every single family in the church and ask for money. You want me to do what? I said, okay. So I went. I explained God's plan. I said, I don't want to know what you can give. I won't know if you do give or don't give. But one year later, we paid off a $1.2 million debt, and we had so much more money, we renovated our sanctuary and other buildings. God did the miraculous. You have to choose to be different. You have to be willing to put yourself out there and look like a fool. And I can't tell you the celebration. When we burned that note in the sanctuary, the thrill and the joy and the shock, I didn't rub it into people's faces. I just said, let's praise God from whom all blessings flow. You have to be willing to step out like Noah, like Moses, like David, like Jesus. Some of you right now, God has been impressing things on your heart for maybe weeks or months or even years, but you won't do it. Because you're afraid of how you will look, how it will come across. You want to change America? You want to change our culture? You want to change the things at work, in your community, at your schools? you got to step out. you got to step up. you got to choose to be different. And when you don't know what else to do, what do you do when you know you're supposed to do the right thing, but you don't know what to do? You do what to do? You pray. You go to God and you pray. God... All right, I'm in. I'm in. Now tell me the next step. What's the next step for me? Paul writes about this in 2 Thessalonians. He says, this is why we're all, we always pray for you, asking our God to help you live the kind of life he's called you to live. In other words, if God's called you to do this, he'll give you the power to do it. We pray God's power will help you do the things you want to do. He says, just pray. Ask God for help, and he'll give it to you. Because prayer can do what other things cannot do. Here's the fourth principle I see from the life of Noah. To make a difference in our culture, you must not let discouragement stop you. Here's what I do know. From the moment God calls you to do something, whatever, whenever that is, there will be a time delay until it happens. And during that year, I'm, I'm going from family to family at Deer Park asking for money. There was a time delay before all of that money came in. There was a time delay before we could burn that note. 
But we get impatient. We, we want it now because we feel anxious that we're the one out front doing this. So you can't let discouragement stop you. Great people do not let discouragement stop them. They may get discouraged for a moment, but they don't let it stop them. God takes ordinary people like you and like me, and he uses them in extraordinary ways. We know from the New Testament all of the disciples were uneducated men. None of them had what we would call an education. They were men of ill repute, fishermen, tax collectors, foul mouth guys. And in three years, Jesus transformed them into a power to be so different that you and I are here today. Just ordinary people, letting God use them in extraordinary ways. Noah looks out over his culture and it's perverted. But think about it. He doesn't even have a church family to support him. He doesn't have friends to support him. He's being ridiculed. He's being mocked. He's being made fun of. He's being joked about. But he doesn't let that discouragement stop him. I mean, think about it. What if halfway through the project he just quit? We wouldn't be here today. Because the flood was still coming. Look at Hebrews eleven seven. It says this. Noah trusted God. I want you to circle that phrase, trusted God. Noah trusted God. When he heard God's warning about the future, Noah believed him even though there was no sign of a flood and wasting no time, he built the ark and saved his family. Noah's belief in God was in direct contrast with the disbelief of the rest of the world, which refused to obey, and because of his faith, he became one of those whom God has accepted. So you can't let discouragement stop you. Some of you want to make some changes in your family. Some of you want to make changes in your business. You want to make changes at your schools. You want to make changes in your neighborhoods. What God is saying to you now, don't quit. Don't quit. Don't quit. Push through it. Push through it. Keep pushing. Keep prevailing. Scholars tell us this. Here's how many years it took Noah to build the ark. It took Noah 120 years to build the ark. I mean, that's quite a project. And God says, then the flood's going to come. I can hear everybody back then, oh, Noah, <laughs> where is that flood? Where is it, Noah? Man, he's kooky. He's nuts. You've been at this how long now? A hundred years? There ain't no flood. I mean, do you think you can maintain enthusiasm for a project that took you 120 years to complete? That's 43,800 days. And the Bible says God extended his life so that he could finish the project. I mean, do you think you could keep up with the same project day in, day out for 120 years? He kept on going. He kept on working. He kept on serving. He kept on obeying. He kept stepping out in faith. He chose to be different. He chose to depend on God. He chose to go against the crowd. And you and I are here today because of it. Noah didn't quit. I imagine there are times maybe around Day 42,001, he probably looked at this thing and going, will this thing ever be finished? I can see him now going home after a long day's work. Walks in the house, his wife says, honey, how you doing? It's another day in the neighborhood, another nail in the ark, another board up. Would you agree that there's a lot in this world to be discouraged about? There is. There's a lot in our culture to be discouraged about today. All you got to do is turn on the television. All you got to do is pick up a magazine. All you got to do is go on the internet. And when I read the current state of our country and where it is today, the high crime rate, the looting, all the protests that are going on, all the political turmoil that's going on, how polarized our nation has become, it's easy to get discouraged. But I don't, and here's why. Discouragement is a warning light. It's a warning light, folks. It's a warning light to what? It's a warning light you're not looking at life from God's point of view. You have forgotten the big picture. And the big picture is this. God is still is in control. God hasn't written the last chapter yet. There's going to come a time when he closes everything up. He'll settle the score. He'll even everything. He'll settle down. He'll bring justice. He'll right what's been wrong. In the end, listen to me, in the end, we 
win. We win. And right now, we're in this era in our country where we are torn about what we see. But read my lips. In the end, we win. And Noah didn't forget that. Look at Genesis 6, 9. I mean, Galatians 6, 9. It says, let us not get tired of doing what is right. For after a while, we will reap a harvest of blessing if we don't get what? Discouraged and give up. It's easy to get discouraged. And when you get discouraged, it's because it's a warning light. And it's a warning light. You have forgotten the big picture that God is in control. So this kind of occurred to me. It's going to come up on the screen. Some people may ask, well, if this world is in our permanent home and we're just passing through, this is like the front inch of the yardstick. If life is going to be far more on the other side, of eternity than on here, why should I try to make a difference in this world? It's a good question. It's an honest question. Well, here's another way to, to ask this question. Should I even make an attempt to influence my community for good, my business for good, my school for good, my nation for good, the world for good? Why should I even make an attempt to make it a better place if I'm just passing through? Because of what Jesus says to us in the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 5. Jesus said this, you are the world's salt seasoning, to make it tolerable. If you lose your flavor, what will happen to the world? You are the world's light, a city on a hill, glowing in the night for all to see. Don't hide your light. Let it shine for all. Let your good deeds glow for all to see so that they will praise your heavenly Father. Jesus said, you're the salt of the earth, meaning you're the preservative. We add salt to all kinds of things, especially meat and pork and other things, to keep it preserved. Jesus said, you're the salt. You're what keeps this world from getting rotten even more than it already is. You're the preservative for the world. He says, be that light. Now, there's two ways this is used by Jesus. Yeah, it does mean we're to share our faith. It does mean that. But I want you to see how Jesus connects it here. He says, don't hide your light. Let your good deeds glow. Light is not just something we shine for others to see. It's something that others experience. We, we find ways to do good to the very people who do not like us as Christians. We go out our way to build a bridge to them. We find ways to be kind to them. When they're mocking us, when they're joking at us, when we're at the, the brunt of their jokes, we're kind. We do a good deed. A lot of people wear fish, they wear crosses around their neck, they got bumper stickers, they'll sign petitions, they'll march in all kinds of marches. They'll do all kinds of things. But if I don't do good to the people who are lost in this world, especially the people living ne next door to me, I'm no good. I know some people who are far more interested in saving America while their next door neighbor is still going to hell. We need, about, we need to be about saving people who are on their way to hell. The only way we can save America is one soul at a time. What's the hope of America? It's not Donald Trump. It's not Joe Biden. It's not the Democrats. It's not the Republicans. What's the hope of America? God tells us. His name is who? Jesus is the hope for America. Folks, our hope is not in the man we put in the White House. It's the man we put on the cross. He's the hope for America. We don't need another social program. We need a Savior for America. And the greatest thing that you can do, that I can do, is share Jesus Christ with everyone we encounter. And as I've told you over and over, that doesn't mean you chase them down and hit them with your King James Version Bible until you knock them out. You just simply tell people what's the difference Jesus is making in your life. If, if I didn't believe that Jesus was the hope for America, I wouldn't be a pastor. I'd become a politician, okay? So I want to suggest to us on this Independence Day weekend that if you want to be a great citizen, if you want to make a difference, tell people how they can have their past forgiven. 
Tell them how they can have a present life that Jesus promised, an abundant life here in the midst of everything else going on, and a home in heaven. And it is my prayer that God will bless America. But we as Americans, we must repent as a nation. What I want to do for the next few moments, I want to ask all of us to just go into prayer about some things in our nation. And I'm going to give you six different things to pray about where you're sitting. If it, if it wasn't COVID-19, I'd have us come all down here. But I'm just going to have you sit where you are. So would you just bow your heads and close your eyes for a moment? Lord, it's my prayer that all of us will dare to be different. Help us to develop an eternal perspective, to see life from your point of view. Help us to depend on you for help, to know that when you ask us to do something, you always give us the power to do it. Lord, help us not to get discouraged by what we see on the news and in the media and on the internet. Help us to maintain your perspective, to realize that you, God, no matter what's going on, you're still in control. Help us to share the good news of Jesus Christ with other people. So here's first what I want you to pray for, right where you are. I want you to pray for our president. Pray that God would give him wisdom. It doesn't matter which party you're, you belong to. We're commanded to pray for our political leaders. Pray that President Trump would be an humble man, an obedient man. He would listen to the voice of God and the Holy Spirit in his heart. Take a moment right now to pray for him. 